Hey guys, Jeff here. Today's video, I'm going to show you how to go from an open exposed wall cavity to a completely finished soundproof room. Okay, now listen, this is going to be a great assembly for anybody making a music room or a theater room or an office, right? Or just trying to insulate a bedroom to have a little bit of peace and quiet. So at the end of this video, I'm going to do a sound test as well to see if I know what the heck I'm talking about. Cheers. And here's the system. You peel off plastic from one side so that you can keep clean and wrap this bad boy up. We're gonna stretch it out as we go. Mm. Make sure you get all around the back of it. There we go. Seal up your wire protrusions. There we go. Try to keep it nice and tight to the box so you're not gonna affect your drywall installation. There we are, okay? Yeah. One pad per plug. All right, don't try to be cheap. This doesn't stretch like putty. It's a little more dense than that. So you're only gonna get one pad on each one of these electrical boxes. And if you have a big double box, you're gonna need two pads for one of those. As you can see, this is R20 fiberglass insulation. It is the next gen fiberglass though, okay? So I recommend wearing some kind of a mask when you're working with it. But the reality is you can see a couple fibers flying around. <sighs> For the most part, this stuff is non-itch, okay? It is a lot nicer to work with than the old generation stuff. You're going to want to put an R20 or at least an R14 bat in the wall. It's okay if it gets compressed. We're looking for mass, not for thermal break. So if you put an R20 insulation here and it compresses because R20 is for a 2x6 wall, you put it under compression, that's okay because you have the same mass in the wall. We're going to just fill up all of our cavities and that's going to be step one. So step one is this in the wall. In the ceiling though, we're going to go double layer. We want as much mass as possible when we're thinking about an acoustical environment and that's why we're going to go two layers in the ceiling, one in the walls, and then we're also going to be adding the sauna fan. There's two other issues I would just point out real quick. One is the insulation. Now I know that there's lots of people on the market and they will talk about using mineral wool for doing soundproofing. And yes, it works, but I'm going to say that this is 95% as effective and half the price. Call me cheap, but I'm going to be using this for the rest of my life, right? This is also next gen, so it's easy to work with. It doesn't make your arms itchy or anything, so it's pretty cool. Now you put in two layers, okay? You want to stagger your joints, because soundproofing is all about managing the movement of air. And if you can eliminate air movement and then you add mass on top of that, you get a really effective sound barrier. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna finish strapping the ceiling and then we're gonna be installing our sauna pan, green board. And then the secret to success here, because my client wants pot lights. And when you're soundproofing this room, you have to create a layer of soundproofing and then you have to build inside that. So what we're gonna do is after we get the green board up, we're gonna actually strap the ceiling again with two by threes. They'll create an inch and a half space so that we can drill out the location for the pot lights and after the green board is up, the electrician's gonna come back and run the wire for the locations. And then we'll come back in here, we'll install the drywall, drill the holes, and all of that wiring will be on this side of the soundproofing barrier. And so our drywall is gonna be fire rated and that'll have lots of mass in it. And that'll be part of the solution, but the green board isn't going to have any holes or any air leaks. And that is gonna make the biggest difference in that, that transfer of noise from this room upstairs. All right, now the strapping's up, quick tip. When we put our board up, we're gonna wanna know where the strapping is over here. I didn't use a laser level to install this. It's just to get the material up in the air. So I'm gonna make a mark with a marker, middle of all these strappings. It doesn't matter if you have plastic or paper-faced insulation, just mark your wall. Even the top of your frame sometimes will work. Easily identify where you're gonna start. And then over here at the edge of the board, you can tell, right? Makes life simple. We're gonna use the drywall lift to throw this up in place. Traditionally, when I'm working in these environments, I don't trust the walls are square. I'm curious though, because <laughs> the nature of this panel, I would love it if this was square. Make my life so much easier, right? So we're gonna give it a try. But generally what I do is I'll measure off the wall 45, 46 inches and then I'll install the second piece and then I'll measure back and then cut it and install the first piece. Usually the only way to get that angle perfect. We'll see if we can get lucky. Now this is my sauna pan insulation panel currently being sold at Home Depot in Canada with very limited availability in the United States. If you want to get this product where you live you got to scream and yell a little bit and uh, let them know that you're really interested in it. I'm going to go this way keep these feet against the outside wall and there we go. We'll just drive this over We'll check the framing. Well, actually, that's not bad there. <laughs> I might get lucky. I'm gonna back it up a little bit. I gotta get past my two by four on the wall. And the screw. <laughs> All right. Wow, I got lucky. 
All right, now remember, the reason I went quick and simple and dirty here is because I'm going to add another layer of strapping underneath all this after the wiring is run, and I'm going to go with a full sheet of drywall from end to end. So I'm not concerned about situations like this. I'm not going to take the time to put more strapping up here. I'm going to screw at that location, right? And that board will be held in place. And then we'll install the next piece and so on and so on. We'll stagger our joints. Won't be a problem at all. We're using a one and five eighths drywall screw to go through the one inch board and a three quarter strap. If I install the screw head flush, I guarantee I can't puncture any other wiring or plumbing or anything else that's in the ceiling that's being hidden by the insulation. And that is plenty of grab. Just want to get it up there snug as a bug in a rug. I'm just going to throw about 12 screws for each panel. The less fasteners, the better at this stage, because every fastener is made of metal and will transmit sound. <laughs> so less is more. I'm going to stick about 12 and I'm going to throw up a few more panels and show you how to stagger these joints. We'll just jump into a time lapse real quick. I'm going to save you all the gory details of watching me install every single piece, but I'll show you this. Just make sure you measure off where your heat ducts are, okay? And then you can draw it with a circle with the marker. Working with this stuff, marker's your best friend. You can draw a circle where your heat run is. Grab a handsaw. This is a drywall saw. Okay, and it is going to run you slower than drywall. Don't be frustrated, okay? It is a very densely packed fiber, but it will get the job done. Or you can use a cutout tool. Again, this kind of dust is brutal. You probably want to have a mask on when you're doing it. Again, that's not the tool, that's the density of the material. You'll get it done. There we go. Now, once I get all the ceiling in, we'll just come back into camera. We'll talk about getting the walls installed and how we're going to seal the gaps between panels. Because you'll notice right over here, there's a 1 8 inch gap. I didn't get the panel perfectly squared off, but the, I'll show you the secret for closing up those gaps, the materials you want to use, and all the rest of the board. We want to finish the ceiling and then get the walls on, all right, so that we're, we're creating an overlap. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. My job today is to get the rest of the screen board on so that the electrician can come and do his job later. All right, so next day we had the electrician come in and he ran the loops for our lights, but I just wanted to walk through the assembly here just to make sure that we're all clear. We'll start up here in between the joist cavity, two layers of R20 fiberglass pink next gen insulation. And then we use a one by three strapping nailed to the joist. And then the green board is screwed to the strapping and slightly, I'm talking six to eight screws per sheet, four by eight. And then we strapped over top of the strapping with a three inch construction screw through a two by three. Then we run the wiring. This wiring is actually stapled to the side, so it's up to code. This will get tucked in like this when we put the drywall on. And then when it's time, we'll install drywall to this, and then we can drill out the hole, connect the wire to the box, tuck it up the hole into this little cavity space here. That gives us the green board 100% continuity on the ceiling. It'll also give us the ability to bring the soundboard right up to the side and encapsulate the room. All the walls, the ceiling is gonna be green board to green board, and then we can use an acoustic sealant or an spray foam for any small gaps or cracks to get rid of any air leaked possibilities. And this is how you get pot lights in the ceiling and keep the sound down. If we put drywall right directly over top of the green board, I'd have to drill that out too for every pot light. And those six holes would eliminate all of the work that we put into this room. I know it sounds like a lot of work, a lot of material, but you're either going to get it right or you're not. If you want a really quiet soundproof room, you got to go with that kind of integrity, okay? I know in school they don't do you any favors. They tell you 50% to pass, 80% makes you a genius. But in a construction situation like this, you have to be somewhere between 99 and 100% of what you do. It's all about doing it right. It's integrity. There's no such thing as, well, I did soundproof 85%. No. That'll be noisy as hell. Now we got a couple of other issues here I wanted to show. The electrician ran wire and then he closed up again. That was nice. Looks like a crime scene. <laughs> I want to bring your attention up here and I'm going to open up this cavity here a little bit, but I'm going to cut on the stud so I can tape it up really easily afterwards. All right. Look at this gap. The insulation fell. When you're working, if you see something like that, stop what you're doing because that's the outside. That's going to be cold air in the winter time and that's going to have condensation. That's going to make the insulation wet, which is going to destroy the R value year after year after year. It gets worse, worse, worse. Then the studs start to rot. Then the mold starts to show up. This is what we're dealing with. In construction, we can't have that. That's my exterior wall. Now you'll see that around here, they've got this purple foam. When they built this house, before they did the insulation and the rim joist, they did a thin layer of spray foam around the entire room joist, just to create that perfect air seal on that part of the house. But this should be lifted back up into position because I know it fits. I just know that whatever happened, it's slumped. And just because I'm gonna make sure 
I can't afford to have an issue here. Double check. Yeah, this one's slumped too. There we go. Now we got good contact. You gotta love an electrician because they do a great job of meeting the electrical code. But when they're fussing around with your vapor barrier and your insulation, make sure you follow up that everything is still closed up properly. That one little dark space behind the plastic is gonna end up destroying all the work in this room. For the record, when you're opening up a wall, if you cut in the middle of the joist, you have something behind it to put pressure on to get a good seal. And if you cut straight, you can repair something rather simple without having to use a whole roll of tape. Now, when it comes to doing lighting in a theater room, you've really got two options. You're gonna see real common in a lot of theaters, they're gonna have like wall lights, like sconce, because you can have a box, you can putty pad it, and it generally, it's a pretty decent way to seal it up. In a ceiling, however, if you want pot lights, there's two ways to do it. You can create a box that your pot light can be cut into out of the green board, really five-sided box. Or you can install all your green board nice and tight, and then you can run another layer of strapping, that's a two by three, because what this does is it gives you something you can staple. You can staple in the side, run your wiring, and then what you've got is a place where your wiring can go while you're drywalling, and then you can drill your hole, and then you can wire your device box. You can put it up through the hole, slide it to the side, and then install your pot light, and you're not breaking through your sound barrier. Having a continuous barrier of sonopan is the secret to success here, okay? So remember, if air moves, sound travels. By sealing all of this up really good and then dropping the ceiling another inch and a half, I know everybody's like, oh, but the space, nonsense. If you're gonna go for soundproofing, the most important thing is the sound. Everything else gets sacrificed in every decision you make. So complete layer of sound and pan, and then we're gonna seal it all up. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna throw a couple panels on the wall. I'm gonna show you how to seal it up properly. That way you are ready to roll. Thing about this stuff is it is super lightweight. Kinda. It weighs about the same amount as a sheet of drywall. We're gonna install this with one and five eighths drywall screws. That is going to give us all of the support we need. We don't wanna go use too many screws. Okay, we're literally just talking about the perimeter, something to keep it in place. When the drywall gets installed, we're gonna use a two and a half inch drywall screw and that'll finish connecting everything. The less pieces of metal you have in the wall, the better off you are. We just wanna have enough to hold this in place. And to hold the board in place so that I can roto zip out the window. That's right, you can use a drywall cutout tool on Sonopan to cut everything out of the way. These fibers are pretty hard on the mouth. Wear a mask when you cut it. And this is where we're gonna run into problems, right? Because whenever you build with wood, it's never as tight a seal as you'd like it to be. Now there are two ways to seal up gaps and air movement. One of them is just this, the black goop. This is called the Acousta Seal and you will know this if you're in the business, it's a product we use with Vapor Barrier. It's how we seal the plastic to wood or plastic to metal framing even. And it works like a charm in this scenario as well. So you wanna treat this like a caulking. You wanna caulk all of your joints. It's that simple. That gets rid of any of the air that passes between the boards. Now this stuff doesn't dry. So you put a nice thick bead here. Okay, and you don't wipe it in. You don't worry about it. You don't tool it. You don't finger it. Okay, just get it in, get it on and get it done. All right. And this is a little bit messy, but that's fine. We're not gonna get our knickers in a knot over that, okay? Bam, okay. That's way number one. Second option is if you have holes, you can use expansion foam. Now, I don't expect everybody to have a fancy gun, so I'm not gonna show you that, but I've got a gap right here. And this board is because of the roof and compression. I'm not a big fan. So what I am gonna do, instead of using caulking in the middle of the room and having the black goo dri dripping everywhere, I'm just gonna use the foam and it's under compression and it's slow. I mean, it's, the more pressure you use on the tip, the more foam comes out, right? So you should be able to keep this inverted. Oh, brand new cans, sensitive. Here we go. Nice, gentle bead. The trick with this is having the can as upright as possible so that you're not just pushing all the gas out of the can. Here we go. The combination of these two products will work to seal up every one of your gaps. I know it's a labor of love, right? But when it comes right down to it, when you're soundproofing, you can do 95% soundproofing and it's no different than 50%, okay? So if you're gonna do it at all, use every ounce of integrity that you got in your body and seal every gap and crack, all right? Once you've got all that done, you're ready to hang drywall. All right, so before I tackle the heat, I just wanted to deal with this mess. Yep, that's not useful at all. I'm all for having a little extra Wire, it's nice if you're wiring to be able to work down here instead of over your heart, because that makes life a lot easier. Having them the same length is gonna help with that. I don't have 10 pounds of wire hanging down out of that ceiling. I can manage installing drywall in that scenario. There we go. 
Okay, now moving on. Here's my duck. This hole is cut pretty much exactly to what I need, but that's not really what I want to go for. I want to have a bigger hole so I can actually get a drill in there and add a screw later. And I've got to get my tools in here to crimp this. So I'm going to cut the hole much bigger than I need. And then we will come back with spray foam to finish that off. Yes, I am. God bless it. All right, here we go. Okay, now this duct, it's not moving anywhere. Oh, here we go, we can go to here. Good, then I can screw it and then stick it back up. Here's a $30 tool everybody should own. This is crimpers. It's uh, three blades on two. And basically what we do here, I'll start on this side, is you take a six inch pipe and you make it just a little bit smaller by crimping it. So it's the same amount of material, but it's zigzagging back and forth. It's like driving through the country on a highway versus a road that goes around a river or, or a lake, right? It takes forever zigzagging around. This shortens the distance of the diameter of this pipe so that I can slide an existing pipe over top. I could have crimped the metal that I'm gonna use as my extension and stuck it in, but then I'd be causing resistance right at the last point. And we don't want that. So by crimping the pipe in the ceiling, I'm not interrupting with the airflow or the efficiency of the system. Boom, nice. Now I got a little six inch extension. Because what I'm doing is I'm calculating my extension from the green plus my framing plus 5 8 drywall plus the fact that this will squeeze up Okay, bam, there we go. Now that is a nice piece of ductwork. And because I'm hanging nice and low here, I'm gonna get either one of the right screws or the, change my bit. Got two of the buggers here. All right, that's right there. There we go. One on the other side here. Good, now we'll check to see how much height we get. There we go, so now when I go and install my drywall, It'll be sitting on the duct, okay? And it'll have resistance, which is perfect. So then when I come back with my roto zip tool, I just go in and find the edge, skip it and zip it. That's problem solved there. We also have a problem in the corner dealing with the plumbing. So let's go tackle that mess. Now you'll notice that the way they got this hooked up here, they're not using a frost free line. So they're using a quarter turn shutoff valve and then a bleeder valve. Now when you turn the water off and you open this up, it lets whatever water is in that line drain back into the room, which could be a little messy, so have yourself a pail. But it's one way to guarantee that there's no water in your hose bib. The other way is you turn it off, go outside, get a vacuum, and like literally vacuum the line right out, okay? Now, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a first piece of green board here. 26 and three quarters is my measurement. I've already checked the entire bulkhead. It's all perfectly straight. So we're just gonna cut a few of those, but for now, 26 and three quarters, okay? Let me show you how to cut sauna pan green board. With your Olfen knife, you wanna to go to the second line on your blade. That's the perfect depth. Lock it in, use your drywall square. Get a score. All right, now move that out of the way. Watch the magic happen. Now you start at the top buried right in there. Use a little bit of force. Okay. Done. That's about as pretty as it cuts, okay? Don't get worked up over the details. If you want it prettier on the back side, you gotta cut it a little bit more. And then you're gonna end up scoring the sheet behind you. I only got a bit of a scratch. The secret here is we're gonna put this up and I wanna have a hole in this board right where I wanna be reaching up. So let's go 11 inches in the middle. 13, yeah, it's right in the middle. 11 inches this way. That's my middle, okay? Now. To make this effective, you have to remember the end from the beginning. We're gonna be putting our drywall over top of this. I can put a nine inch door on it, which is an eight by eight hole. So there's four, there's eight, there's four, there's eight. So there's my hole. That's for the drywall. Now, if I make an eight inch hole here, then I just need to get myself like a 12 inch piece of green board that I can rest on top after I install this part of the soffit. That makes any sense. If not, just keep watching. We'll show you what we do. Here we go. Same thing. OK. 
Okay, I'm gonna make a trap door. Done. All right, now in case you're wondering, a 26 inch span is perfectly acceptable when you're working with 5 8 drywall. The reinforcing of that, dry, of that fiber makes this really doable. All right. And this is why God invented showers. All right, and make sure we're flush here. Okay. Okay, now I got my trap door and my sauna pan. I'm gonna use a two and a half inch screw right here in the middle. And so when you reach up, acts as a little 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 door handle. So as long as that screw's in the middle, you know you're gonna have a good good seal. Okay. There we go. So now we've got our green board in place. We've got an ability to access that. We know when we put our drywall over, we're just gonna cut an eight by eight hole here. That's problem solved. We got the ductwork solved. We got that solved. I think now it's time to throw up our first sheet of drywall. But first, before the drywall, I've got to put a couple more pieces of the green board on the soffit. One step at a time, Jeff, don't get ahead of yourself. We wanna have a nice tight seal here. So we'll get another piece underneath, a couple pieces on the side, and we'll jump into some drywall. You'll be able to see the whole assembly come together really well then. Now for everybody who has an issue with a window like this, this is actually, it looks like, is it one and a quarter inch? Yeah, one and a quarter inch framing. And then my board comes right to here. Okay, I'll give you an idea of what's going on. We can see our concrete foundation. One of the best things you can do is take your green board right up against that. That way you actually have a thermal bridge here as well up against your concrete so you don't have your drywall in contact with your masonry if i just go back here with drywall or all wood i don't have a thermal break anymore because wood is a lousy insulator when it's that thin so i'm going to use the green board and then i'm going to go five eighths over top it's going to come about the same thickness and then i'm just going to add this one little piece of trim that caps that joint of the drywall and the wood together and paint it all in it's going to be absolutely seamless wow thank god i got somebody on the site helping me out matt just reminded me that i didn't spray foam this gap yet and that's really key right no air leaks in the ceiling all right. Uh, working with these cans upside down, you sure lose a lot of the air, but. Okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Here we go, 125. And just for simplicity, and because I like to work for my breakfast, we are using 54 inch by 12 footers, 5 8 fire rated drywall. Yeah, it's heavy. So I got Matt here today to help me to lift this stuff, but the cutting is the same. Just need a bigger square. You score the paper. Oh, make sure I get all the way through. There we go, stand it up, and then you gotta walk it out. So the secret when you're working with this material, because it doesn't break like the half inch, okay? It's really difficult. Feel around for that little, that little scratch you make. Grab a hold of the board. And underneath that, put your foot against it. So your knee against it. Now you got three spots where this board is being held in place. And you open it like a door. <coughs> there we go. That gives you a line to cut. And all you're cutting now is paper. And then grab it real quick before it falls over. Here we go. Let's get the lift in here, ready? One motion up and over. Oh, baby. And flip it. Now this is a chain driven model. It locks as soon as I let go, okay? Which is awesome. Now we just wanna drive this right to the outside wall and see if this room is somewhat square. And I wanna go like that. How are we looking? I'm grabbing some stuff here in the window. Okay, I'm gonna pop these down because I don't want them in the way, keeping my drywall from going right in the corner. Being mindful, you don't wanna drive this through the ceiling. Remember that stuff doesn't dry, right? Here we go. So a uh, slight problem, we do have to go against that wall because we need to get past the bulkhead yeah, here. I know, I got you. There you go. Okay. Nothing is a problem. I did measure this off to have a little bit of wiggle room. 
There we go. Split the difference. How big is my gap? Too big. I'm getting five eighths drywall on each side, so I'm splitting the gap. How's that? I'm liking that. Oh shoot, we missed something. <laughs> Sometimes you move fast, you make a mistake. Don't try to fix it, move back and fix it. I forgot to mark where all of my framing is on the wall. I wouldn't know where to put my screws if I don't do this, right? That's a problem. Here we go. And that's a two by two, which is even skinnier. Let's push it back in, nice and tight. Let's put the difference. Got it. <clears throat> All right, now it's time for this drywall screw gun. Now, the uh, wires for that pot light are stuck underneath the drywall. Pull the wires out from underneath that stud. They can't be underneath the wood. There's a lot of extra wire there. When it's all freed up, you can just bend the wires to the right and push them into the cavity. All right, now that that's done, we're good to go. We're just gonna use this drywall screw gun which sets the screws to the perfect depth. Here we are. Just for the record, one in every 20 or 30 screws, it uh, fails. The coating doesn't work. Something's wrecked from the factory, doesn't sit on the end of the drill. There we go. If you're fighting with it, just throw it away. It's not worth the fight. There we go. Now, move the other side. Now, the reason I love this gun, it's the pistol grip. It sits right there in between your finger and you use another finger to turn it on. It's nice and balanced. I remember back maybe 15 years ago, the uh, drill drivers that were out there were pistol grip like this. And we love those. And then they changed the design. <laughs> anyway. If you're watching shorts, you'll see some of these uh, drywall guys out there. They've got the new feed system. So they'll have a, a bunch of screws on a, on a plastic sheet. It's the same as like doing subfloor. You can get screw fed systems for that. But here's the thing about a screw fed system. The screws are about three times as expensive and you're forever stopping to load it. When you can just have a pocket of screws and go. The time you spend reloading and loading that machine, I don't know how many people are actually getting that much work done faster that it's worth the extra. But for the average homeowner out there, if you're doing a whole basement, it's probably got a knot. Or you're thinking about using drywall projects over and over again throughout your career, grab one of these, $99, tool only, right? You already got batteries, problem solved. Why spend $400 on a tool to have screws that are three times the price when you can have a professional tool that up until a couple years ago was the Cadillac in the marketplace. There we go. That machine along with this gun turns anybody into a drywall pro and I'm just creating a line. I don't need to mark anything. Five screws for every sheet. Although it's a 54 inch. What the hell, we'll do six, huh? Now when you're doing your drywall, a lot of guys will put enough screws to get the sheet up and then move on. I'm gonna suggest you just finish every sheet one sheet at a time. So you don't end up forgetting to cut something out. You don't end up forgetting to do a screw line. Nothing worse than being on the mudding stage to realize, oh yeah, I gotta go back and screw the drywall together. That'll drive you crazy. Okay, I think I'm almost done here. All right, okay. Let's cut next sheet, 125 again, and then we'll roto zip this out and see if what we did worked. Wow. Yeah, I went a little wide on that. That's okay. Mac, can I have my spray foam? You know, when you're working in this kind of environment and the, your, your tip hits the spray foam, it's gonna wander, all right? No big deal. At the end of the day, if you haven't seen this trick before. All right, done. Now when that's expanded and hard, I can trim it flush, throw a little paper tape over it, and it'll never crack. All right, perfect. Okay, now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go hang the rest of the drywall in here.
I have got two barn doors that I'm going to cut to fit to use as pocket doors because they look really sexy. They're going to be framed up like the letter Z or Z, depending on which part of the world you live in. Before I can build anything, I've got to get my subfloor system attached. Note, understand in the end from the beginning. Here's the pocket door frame. Looks pretty darn flimsy. And right now it's held together with a plastic bracket, which is great. You can see at the bottom here, there's a little metal bracket with a screw hole. What a great location, right? One little spot to put in a screw. So my job is to figure out where this goes <laughs> in relationship to my door and then extend another piece of wall behind it. But because I'm putting in a subfloor system, I'm getting a thermal break and five inch OSB I don't want to raise up my floor an inch and a quarter in front of this or around this. So I'm going to throw my subfloor system in place first and then start constructing on top of that. So let's go get some subfloor. And in the world of subfloor systems, there's a myriad of options. And if you haven't seen it, I'll put a link in the video description. We did a whole video talking about six different subfloor systems, what to use where and when and why, because there's a lot of different solutions and you can actually factor in cost. Okay, what I'm doing today is building materials. It's not a sponsored product. This particular subfloor is three quarter inch closed cell foam with five eighths OSB plywood. This will be very easy for me to build out and finish off. There we are. Since they didn't chalk a line, I'm gonna go ahead and do myself a favor. I'm gonna square off my subfloor to whatever the heck is going on here. Yeah, I like that. All right, now a system like this, really easy to install. Here we go. This is next gen Tapcon screws. Look at this sexy stuff, huh? One of the most common questions I got is what kind of Tapcon screw do you use with your subfloor system? And I'm gonna recommend this 3 16 is the width, the diameter of the screw, and two and three quarters, that's for the length. Now here's why. Concrete floors are usually poured three to four inch, but you don't need three inches of screw in the concrete to hold down the subfloor. Generally, you want half of the screw in the concrete and half the screw your floor assembly. So I got three quarter subfloor and five eighths OSB. Which means that I am gonna be more than fine with a two and a half inch screw. Two and three quarter is just a little bit of extra insurance. Okay, we're about to find out if the bit that comes in the package is the right size hole. Here we go. Now, if this is done right, this type of pan head should go flush with the wood when it's finished. Oh. Okay, maybe I didn't go all the way to the chuck. We'll try that again, here we go. One of the parts of the problem with using this kind of impact driver is it's really hard on screws. Okay, much happier with that. <laughs> really the key is make sure that your hole is deep enough to receive the screw because you can't force it any deeper once you hit concrete on the bottom. Let's get a second screw in just so this thing isn't sliding around on us. See the little volcano action? Traditionally, my method of doing this was never clean out the hole. For whatever reason, this concrete pour, this particular screw, the size of the drill bit, if I don't clean out the hole, there's too much resistance and I'm shearing off the head. And it really is a learn as you go scenario. There's no such thing as one rule for life. Products change, materials change. That's a new product. I've never used the white screws before. So if you run into trouble and you keep ripping your heads off, try cleaning out the hole a little bit, all right? Now remember, pocket doors are designed to be installed on your subfloor. And that's what this is now, okay? Not the finished flooring. That'll be fine. We'll get along just great with that. Uh, step two in this process is find the center of the hole. We're looking at uh, 68 and a half, which means 34 and a quarter. That's about here. Okay, and whenever you make something center mark, throw a C on it. That'll tell the whole world what that is. Just in case there's an extra mark and you come back later and you go, oh, I can't remember which one was which. Now you know. Here comes the pocket door uh, marvel. In a perfect world, this is all just gonna line up and be absolutely tickety-boo. But because of my sound insulation, I have a bit here that I gotta cut out, okay? Get that trim in nice and snug. There we go. Now, this is an uncoupled wall. This is part of the soundproofing system. We are not attaching anything about this wall to the existing wall. We're only gonna attach this to the subfloor, which isn't attached to that wall, and to the ceiling, which isn't attached to that wall. So we're making an interior wall of a wall so that we don't have any direct contact from inside to outside through either wood or fixtures or fasteners, sorry, so that there's no capacity for that sound to travel. 
And that's the key. It's bad enough that we're sacrificing a little bit of quality here because, well, let's face it, this basement, that's the only window right behind you. And if we don't have pocket doors here, there's no daylight coming into the rest of the space. And every once in a while, when you lose power, it's nice to have a little daylight. <laughs> we are going to start with that, and then we are going to integrate. This is how these things are done. It's been a while, Jeffrey, or what? Hey, holy cow. And this all just fits together like a little puzzle. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> Boom. I've got to trim back this green board just a little bit. It is going to be in my way. Uh, yes, it's that easy. If you've never worked with this Persona Pan product before, watch the first video in this series because you're going to see all the benefits of it. But let's just face it, the sound quality in this room for a basement is amazing. And that is the beginning of a theater room for sure. It's not just sound separation, it's sound management. Here we go. Round two. We're going to set everything where we want to set it. And ultimately that means that I have to consider how I'm finishing out here as well. So I got things where I want to put them. Let's check to see if we're level. Next, I'm going to hold it in position. The center line on the green board I transferred onto this. Now I'm going to transfer that line here because I'm going to have a pocket door on that side as well. This is a two-door system. So instead of having this finished and a return, I'm going to cut it off so it's continuous all the way through. That's all I need, right there. I'm just going to grab my saw and cut this bad boy. So here's what that looks like inside. From here over is the frame. This is the extension. This doesn't have to be here. I might even end up taking it away and retrimming it out. But for now, we'll keep it in place and you can see all this extra space. When you hang a door, you simply take your door and you mount your wheels a few inches from the end so they never come off the track. Okay, here we go. Whenever you got a tool like this, always cut something and then mark exactly where the blade eats. That way, whenever you're cutting something, you're not just cutting the length, you're cutting where you want the blade to eat, which is super important. There we go, it's just brad nailed. We are gonna set these aside for later. We may or may not use them. All right, here we go. I'm gonna cut the top of this as well. So I'm gonna repair my door kit now. Instead of relying on these brad nails, I'm gonna actually drive a screw into soft wood lumber. It's almost guaranteed to split. So what I'm gonna do is gonna go in reverse. I'm gonna pilot hole my drill until I'm almost finished, and then I'll drive it forward. Once you see it smoking like that, it's kind of like cauterizing a wound. It'll never split. Lined up where I want it. Just before we start a fire, that's where you want to pull it. Okay, there we go. And away we go. Now we're ready. French door, pocket door. The only thing I have to do now is continue the subfloor and then measure the same frame back to this location, cut it, join it together, and then we can finish off with brand new trims that go all the way to the outside. That's the easy part. So now I got a system. All I have to do now is get some two by fours, make a couple of boxes so I can mount floor to ceiling, screw this to that box, duplicate that to the other side. And we've got a pocket door system. <laughs> here we go for the first time in a while. First time I pulled the laser level out on this job since I've been here. Anyway, here's what we're gonna do. These uh, door kits come with a jam for the other side of the hole. And so I'm gonna incorporate it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close up. This turns out to be the perfect depth for the thickness of this wall. <laughs> Who knew? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set it here. I'm gonna put it on shims, level it off, and then I'm gonna bring this up to that point. And then I'm gonna cut and mark this again. If I do that on both sides, it's gonna change the way that I finish this, but at least it'll look really bloody finished. And that'll be a good thing. So I already know, because I use the level, that both of these walls are like this. So the bottom is gonna go flush, and then I'll shim from there. All right, here we are. Okay, well here we are. We're gonna just release all of this packaging and get my other jam. There it is, put that in storage. If you ever get material like this, don't throw it out. One day you'll need it and then you go to the store to buy one and you realize they wanna charge you 15 or 20 bucks for it. So small little pieces of the rectangle are worth the weight in gold. Let me get that out of here. We'll put that out of here for now. Let's get that one installed. If I'm gonna do something on one side, I might as well do it on both using the same tools and materials. <laughs> Gotta get used to that. It's not pneumatic. Here's why we're doing this. Because now, 
when I put that in, get that out of the way for now. Boom. That'll be the way it finishes. That looks very intentional. So that's why we're doing this. So the goal here really is to get this installed as level as possible, shim it off. We're just using, taking advantage of an opportunity here, really. You know, like I always say, know the end from the beginning. And you know, when I started putting this together, I thought I had the end figured out, but when I went and checked, that became a very useful piece of extra material. So I'm probably gonna save 15 or 20 bucks for each of those. That's awesome. All right, let's make sure we're flush on the face. Yeah. So this is not square. That's what's going to throw me off. That can be a little frustrating, eh? Just gotta nail it. All right. What do you say? Now I'm just tacking this in for now. I'll use something with a little more robust. Completely level it off later. Okay, here we go. All right. And then here. It is nice when the framing is actually pretty darn level. Makes life simple. Oh, now we can move this over. We'll check our positioning. And then because we marked our center line, I'm gonna double check how my location is working. Wow, I'm still perfect here. Good, that one doesn't need to change. Now, the most interesting thing about this build is I'm trying to have it uncoupled, but I don't wanna have it fall over and hit the cameraman again. So I am gonna just throw one of these in here. It's a two inch nail. Oh, and that didn't grab, did it? Nope, too much material. I'm gonna put one screw in temporarily. How's that sound? There, that'll keep it from falling over. Cause what I gotta do is I gotta make a wall here and I wanna make a little H frame up top in order we can install the drywall. And then we're gonna install this one over here in this location, do basically the same thing. Now well, I'll have to remove this screw later. And when we're back to here, I think what we can do, we should be able to just measure the gap from here to here and then go cut it right now. 34. Okay. I want to have to take one look at this real quick before I go guessing. I better put that on. Take a good look here. Yeah, you see what's not perfect though? Oh, I got it on backwards. One second. There we go. There. That's how that gets installed. Yeah, I'm 34 from the metal. I'm measuring here from the metal. Okay. You only get to do this once or you're buying a brand new frame. So I'm actually 34 and 5 eighths. That's good to know. One oh, damn second. Is it actually perfect? I might not have to do a cut at all. That is really weird. The problem is, is this wood. It's installed in the wrong spot, but I'm getting rid of that anyway. Those are just extra. Okay. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to remove this, pull this over, tie them both together, and then I'll use the shims to install this where I want it when it's done. That's okay, we'll live to fight another day. So, inside these tracks, we've got holes that aren't used. And I'm going to just align my two by four. Here we are. Boom. And I'm just using this like a header, just to make it one door, one piece to manipulate. The more these things are floating around on their own, the harder it is to finish this off. This will square everything off. Boom. Now it's one door. Let's just throw a screw in over here now. Okay, wow, that just took a little bit, way too much brain power. Next thing, let's just move right on into measuring for this frame. We'll go 19. So if I use a 19 top and bottom, I'm gonna be coming in contact with that drywall no matter what I do. Okay, 19 to that point there. Now this takes a little bit of 
guesswork, but I'm gonna intentionally measure shy. I'm gonna to go to 99 and a quarter. And the reason I'm doing that is it's easier to put a wall up and have it be shy, and then use a three inch screw to make contact with those posts, and then to try to make it perfect. All right, now I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna go flush with the face of the horizontal piece on the door. Throw a few screws in here to tie it all together. So this gap is gonna be maintained. Part of using this trim and, and overlapping the cap here, it's causing me a bit of an issue. I mean, it looks pretty, but I gotta, now I gotta maintain this half inch gap all the way over here so I can stay square. There we are. And there's one hole right here in a metal bracket. Well, there we have it, first half. That seemed like a lot more work than it should have been. <laughs> so instead of trusting two by four as a straight edge here, which I can't because this is built out material. So it's really hard to get these aligned properly. So what I do know is that this wall was made on a chalk line. I want to maintain my half inch space right over here. And then I want to make sure you can see that that's pretty level. And I have the adjust the ability to make this adjustment. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to take a two by four. I'm going to go put it on the flat up against the wall. Whew. Yeah, there's just enough space. What to do, what to do. Okay. So I'm not going to have a whole lot of options here. <laughs> that's not even going to reach. Sometimes having a plan end from the beginning is just impossible. <laughs> and you got to make it up as you go along. Sometimes you end up doing it all twice. At least watching this video, you're going to get an idea, the pros and cons of what I'm doing here. All right, there we go. We'll throw another one in. Trying to minimize this, the fasteners connecting these walls as much as possible. But at the end of the day, And that missed. Come on now. Oh, yo, yo. Oh, this has got to go in bloody level, eh? Yeah, that'll work. Okay, the challenge here really is this. I have two doors each inside their own pocket. It's one continues across the top, so the, at least the top meets. What happens at the bottom, I have no idea. But here's the thing, that one screw at the very bottom is accessible even after the fact. So if I have to, I can disengage those two screws, line up the walls, and then drop them in again. So that's my benefit. I really am not gonna know if this is perfect or not until I get the doors in. That'll tell me everything I need to know. Okay, now we gotta get in here. Let's just line that up first. Oh, come on, honey. Okay. Perfect. What if I just added a nailing surface across the top? It's got a couple of measurements here. Really, this is all about having a nailing surface for my drywall. At this point, 77 inches will do the job. And then I need a full one here, flipped up. If it's, because as long as I mount it this way, Max, I can adjust my whole bloody wall down the road once the doors are in. There we go. So that was a lot of fussing around, but we finally got it where I'm happy with it, I think. I'm trying to build a wall inside of another wall. And the last thing I want to be concerned about is everything here level and square, that's old. I can only worry about the doors because they're gonna be coming together. I can't have them like this when they close. We've got the ability to unscrew at the very front 
and make adjustments to each door so I can get the swing perfect. I'm happy with that. I've got a box here that's a nailing surface for drywall tied to the ceiling. Nailing surface up there. I've got this screwed to here and I screwed it at this point here and here. Okay, I'm just leaving an X here so I can find them. If I need to take these out and then reposition the mounting later to make sure everything closes properly, that's an option. So I've got four screws, bottom there and the tops up through here. And that I can access at any time so I can make adjustments as I go. Now it's time to finish closing because tomorrow we start taping this bad boy. Let me just get the first piece on. Got one more trick I want to show you when you're working with a pocket door. Really nice if you're working with 5 8 drywall. They're not really designed for 5 8 drywall. So I'm most likely gonna have to have myself a rectangle if we want to trim it out, but that's not a real big issue. I'm just gonna come here. I'm gonna mark so that it goes into here. That's my location. And I've got to cut so that this joint ends up resting in the middle of this right here. Okay. I want to have a screw surface so that this whole piece isn't just floating in an emptiness. And if you're wondering, yes, this is 54 inch drywall. When I got the delivery for this room, they only had 54 inch drywall, 12 foot sheets available. So unfortunately I had to buy a whole bunch of this stuff. Ugh. Okay. Now, the height to the middle. Yeah, makes sense. Four feet creates a little bit extra work for me, eh? But hey, it's only a drywall. Okay, now here's a warning for you. When you're going to put your screws in on these hollow door kits, you have to remember there's gonna be a door in that hole and you have to buy extremely short screws. Now, if you're using half inch drywall, your half inch plus the full thickness of this wood, it's an inch and a quarter. You can't go with a traditional one and a half inch screw. You gotta go get a one inch screw because when you start sinking it on the tapered edges, the screw sticks out just a tip, just about an eighth. And then when you open and close your door, you get gouges in it and that's maddening. So in this case, I'm using inch and a quarter screw, but that's because I got 5 8 drywall and I got a screw set on this to make sure that it doesn't go too deep. Check, you don't want to feel it at all because all it takes is for wide the doors open. Someone just leans on this wall and it deflects. There goes all your beautiful work. So make sure your screw is short enough. Come on, honey, that it's not sticking out the other side. There we are. All right, well, you get the idea. <laughs> it's drywall. Well, now that our framing is all done and I whipped together a quick pocket door, I'm just joking. This is actually available as a barn door at Home Depot. It's extra wide, extra high, so it's not an 80 inch slab. This is like 84, I think. This is great if you're doing a project and you wanna have a surface barn door on the rollers. Right now they're making these things. So you don't have to construct your own. We're going to actually cut this down just a touch. I love the width. Don't forget my vision for this is to have the door sticking out about three and a half inches and then have a nice handle on each side. So you can just close it and open it from either side and it's not gonna be recessed inside the wall. 100%. I always just found that the hardware for that is sloppy and silly and you gotta stick your thumb in there and pull out the little pin. We're gonna go sexy. Boom, big handles, all right? So. What I wanted to do is take a quick second here to do a little bit of framing and you'll understand in a second because that's a 36 inch. Now here are the wheels. They just pop in and out. These are adjustable. And right now it's just set for the maximum depth. In the package that it comes with, it comes with a tiny wrench and you can stick it on here and you can just lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to take advantage. Oop. There we go. Lots of fussing around. There we go. That's locked in now. And this will sit on top of here and we move it a few inches back just so that it doesn't accidentally fall out through the hole because that comes out pretty quick and easy, right? So by installing it a couple inches back and by adding a screw after we're done, we'll create a bumper and then so it'll stop and that'll be nice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave it fully extended and I'm going to measure for my door from here to the floor and I'm going to compensate for the fact that I'm putting in an engineered hardwood floor and I'm going to try to measure this about as close to perfect as a guy can possibly get and that looks like 80 and three quarters. Now I'm going to slide it over here and double check the measurement. See how close to level, oh right on the money and I'll do the same for this side. See how close to level. Ha <laughs> ha! 
perfect every time. I love it. This is brilliant. It was a bit of fussing around getting this framing in, but now that I've got it level, square, plumb, all those wonderful things, the rest of this project is easy, right? So now I got 80 and 3 quarters. That's the height to my floor. I'm going to take off the 3 quarters. That's not the thickness of my floor, but the truth is, is I got to have at least an eighth of an inch of a gap, right? I can't just drag it across the floor. So we're just going to cut it to 80. Boom. Done. Now, because it's a pocket door, I want to show you this. It's got this phenomenal little guide groove on it, okay? So, what I'm planning on doing is installing that guide groove right outside the door here. So when we're all said and done, I'll slide the doors back and forth. We'll get that lined up, and that groove will help to make them meet in the middle. And then I'm going to use a little mullion trim overside one of the doors to so create like a C-channel so the other door fits into it. And that'll give me my, my airtight seal. Throw a couple magnets on there, we're going to be good to go. Right now we're going to cut the top, and I've got to set one other thing up. I'm going to show you how to set the depth, because you don't want the door sliding all the way into the cavity and damaging your woodwork with your handles. So we've got to create a bumper for that as well. First. Let me just rip this down to 80 and give it a quick sand. So I'm looking to try to screw these a couple inches from the edge. There's my one location, first and second, here we go. All right, and we really want to try to nail this dead on the middle. One and three eighths, just double the bottom. Oh God, this isn't working for me. How about just, that looks like it's in the damn middle to me. There we go. Holy cow, I'm really overthinking, overcomplicating this, all right, now. In a perfect world, I think pre-drilling would be a good idea here, but this is softwood lumber and it should receive the screw, no problem. I'm just making sure because in these environments you usually get a lot of knots. We are going to be just fine. The reason I did that in advance is because this is tricky with hardware. I want to offset it a little bit, make sure you got a direct line. Here we go. Go back. All right. Now let's try to square that off. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Uh, same for the other side. Warning, I did that backwards. This little pin needs to be accessible. So you have to have them on the same side of the door. I like it on the interior side. <laughs> There's gonna be one little piece of trim here, right? And you should just put a couple brad nails in it and that's it. And if you ever need to access this to make adjustments over time, the door can, you know, sag or slump. You can take this one piece of trim off and then you'll be able to see this and have access to this nut. And that's, that's very vital. So make sure that these pins are all facing inside the room. Sometimes you just move so fast, I uh, miss the details. There we go. All right, let's hang this sucker. Hoy. All right, now. Because this is a French door, I can actually install this door after the fact, right? In a lot of cases, if you're only using one panel, you've got to hang the door before you close up the other side, or you got to hang the door, depending on your environment, just to lift it into place. But because this is a French door, I have this kind of freedom. Here we go. Ha, ha, ha. All right. That is phenomenal. And yes, it's too low right now. But like I said, we can take our wrench, we can make adjustments, I can pop it in and out as I need it. But for now, let's take a look at this. And remember what I told you, using the short screws, okay? You shouldn't feel any prickly things on the back. Because here, even while we're just testing this out, this door is bouncing around, right? You don't want to go, oh, I don't really need it. One straight gouge in a piece of wood, the door's garbage, because you'll never fix that. That's my final resting place. Imagine a nice great big handle on here, right? That'd be cool. So, we have to do something to make sure that this doesn't fall all the way in, because I don't want to be damaging the face of my wood. So, let's just try to go with, that's a good measure. 
Looking about two and a half inches to build out. Okay, two by four to the rescue. Huh? That's why it pays to keep scrap wood around. Never know when you're gonna need a two by four. Save the day. All right, here we go. Loving it. Now, in the package with the door comes this little rubber stopper. This is the bumper, and it should be set at about the middle of the door. Right there. Now, that's what happens. You hear that? Almost nothing. Now that sets my door. I got beautiful location for a handle. I'll just stay with a nice, nice big surface screw in situation. This will work perfectly. All right, now all I gotta do is cut the other one, stick it in as well. And I'm gonna stain these in place after the fact. Watch this. I can pull this door all the way out and stain the entire door. I can even cheat, pop over into the next track. <laughs> If I absolutely need to, it's not as easy as you might think, but hey, it can be done. Okay, here we go. I can slide it right over the middle and then I can stain the door and then I can slide it back and I can pull the other one out in the middle and stain that one and let them dry hanging in place. But for now, I gotta use this to get back out of the room. So here we go. So listen, we're gonna just measure off 80 inches on both sides. Alrighty. Gives me an opportunity to see if my drywall square is still square. She's out a little bit. Straight edge, here we go. Because of the nature of the door, this is gonna be up inside the cavity. No one's gonna see it. I don't have to sand it clean. It doesn't even have to be perfect. What it has to be is out of the way. So I'm gonna put my black line above my pencil so I don't eat too much of the door off. I'm gonna have my finger on the side and off we go to the races. There we go. Now that might look a little funny on camera, but just imagine this in the door. I'm gonna have molding and trim work coming down to here. So this door just disappears inside the cavity of the wall. It's not gonna look bad at all. And you don't wanna start cutting off the bottom because that is visible. So keep the factory line, especially when you've got the groove. If I started cutting down there, I wouldn't have a groove anymore. And I would lose the ability to control the base of the door and how it's gonna line up. Just a quick note guys, here's a tip for you. Before you put this casing up, when you're around your windows, anytime you're in a basement, your ceilings, with your doors or your window trim, you're gonna end up with little pieces of wall like this that have to be painted or they look stupid. You can't just paint it in with the trim or with the ceiling paint. So, since you're your own contractor, you get to be the carpenter and the painter, you can reverse the decision and you can paint those hard to reach areas first, okay? Now I get my paintbrush in here without any difficulty. Here we go, that might be better. You can cut your line. There we are. Remember, you can't use any tape on new construction because tape is going to peel the ceiling paint right off of the drywall. It takes about 30 days for paint to cure. So if you don't learn how to paint freehand, you're gonna be a world of hurt trying to get your project done. Okay, now you wanna do both coats above the window, but take a look at how easy that is. Now when you're done, you can put this up, couple of nails, and your paint is perfect every time.
my top 10 tips so that you can have a perfect every time basement renovation paint job. Tip number one, of course, is do a prime check after you've done your drywall. Get your beige mud out or add some chalk, red or blue chalk line dust into your mud so that you can make a colorant. Mix it in and then go look for perfections. Use different kinds of lighting. Use direct light, use offset light. Do prime check in the morning and then do another one in the afternoon. This is not a process that you wanna rush. New construction always has little problems. It's just the nature of the game. Uh, even the drywall will come with dents that are predetermined just from the handling and shipping process. Once you've got all your prime check done, tip number two is you've got to sand your prime check. You've got to sand your walls. Now in this room, we did spray ceilings. We sanded in between two coats of spray. We sanded before we sprayed. The rule with paint in general is this. Once it's dry, you sand it. Now the only time we don't sand is after the last coat is done. Every other time before you touch a wall, you sand. There's always dust. There's always imperfections. There's always a rough surface. And so the best paint jobs are finished by having a smooth surface before you start. Sanding is simple. Use an orbital sander just like in our painting videos right on the drywall right on the primer all right and it's just a quick pass now because this is new drywall you also want to check it with your hand make sure well oh, right there that corner there is just the drywall paper and it had the paint sprayed it's still a little rough there's no mud there it's just the nature of using a sprayer there we go now it's smooth like a baby's bottom. Be picky. You're only going to do this once, so be picky. You'd be the biggest critic in the room and you'll be happy with the job when you're done. Tip number three is all about your trim because when you're doing a project like this, you want to put your flooring in first so that when you install your trim, you can install it right onto the floor and you don't have to add another piece of trim afterwards. Extra trim costs extra money, extra time, extra cogging, extra paint work, and you're always faced with the same dilemma and that is you have to paint right up against the floor. In our system, what you do is you paint all of your baseboard first in another room and then you install it and your nails should always go in the middle of the board. That way, when you're all finished, said and done and you have to paint the touch-ups, you only have to bring your brush and roller halfway down the board because from here to here is already completely finished. That'll help you avoid the costly mistake of getting paint on your flooring and then having to scrape it up or clean it up. Remember, a lot of surfaces today, engineered hardwood even comes with water-based finishes. So you can't use acetone to take paint off of wood and be guaranteed you're not gonna have a problem. That's money in the bank. Now, tip number three you use for your baseboard and your casings. You don't wanna ever have a brush go anywhere near your flooring ever again. Tip number four is this. When you're trimming out your windows, use half inch finished plywood. Use a top grade quality plywood that's super smooth, okay? It's easy to paint, easy to fill. And before you put the top piece of casing on, paint above it on the wall and cut your line. This enables you to add this trim and you'll guarantee you're gonna have room to get your brush in there without getting paint on the ceiling. This is easy to paint the surface only and because you, you don't have to caulk in around the top or paint the top of that trim either. When you're meeting up with an old window, use a piece of trim. And if it's flush, use a square piece of trim that covers the gap. Because over time, if you rely on caulking only in that joint, it's gonna crack, it's gonna gap, because especially in a four season climate, expansion and contraction, caulking loses that battle every time. So always add a piece of trim to guarantee good results long-term. Tip number five. I've seen so many videos on the internet, people using tape to cut tape off the lines before they cut in and to cover their baseboards. Take this. It's of no use to you on new construction. If you wanna avoid destroying your work, don't bring tape to it. Remember, paint takes 30 days to cure. So if you put tape on your baseboard to protect it from getting a little paint on it off the roller, you're gonna peel off the paint. If you put paint around your ceiling to protect it from touching it with the roller when you're doing your walls, you take that tape off, you're gonna rip the paint right off the ceiling. That's important. Tape is not your friend on new construction, it's your enemy. Now, if it's an older house and the paint's been there for years, sure you can use tape, but why don't you just learn how to paint like a pro because it saves you a lot of time and energy. Tip number six is this. When dealing with ceilings, if you use a sprayer, you're way ahead. You get a much nicer finish. There's never any lines on it. And I've got a video to show you how to do that. They rent those machines at the Home Depot. It's easy to use. You don't have to be overwhelmed with the concept of it. I know it's scary and new to a lot of people to use a sprayer, but if you watch that video, we'll put it in the video description. It'll make it a lot easier for you. There's really only three or four tricks you need to know to use a sprayer. But remember this. If you use a sprayer, you get a different texture on the finish. So then when you go to cut and roll your walls, unless you've got a steady hand and you've mastered the art, I'm gonna suggest don't use the sprayer. 
although it looks better, if you use a sprayer and then you make a mistake and you need to do a touch-up, then that touch-up brush or roller mark is going to scream. It's going to say, I just got patched. So consider this. If you're not comfortable with your brushwork, cut and roll your ceilings. Or at least use a brush around the edges and spray the rest and know that it's going to look funny. But I would recommend brush and roller on a ceiling if you're not comfortable using painting without tape. If you are comfortable with it, then get the machine and spray your ceiling every single time. you got a decision to make. You've got two choices when it comes to painting your ceiling. Brush and roll or use the sprayer. If you brush and roll, it's a little bit safer if you make a mistake. If you use a sprayer, you've got to be perfect with your brush. Tip number seven, and I know you're only painting the wall, but cover all of the surfaces in the whole room. And if you've got furniture, cover them too. Because there's nothing worse than going to sit down on a piece of furniture two or three weeks after a paint job, once the paint is cured, and finding a great big pink spot on your blue sofa. Buy tarps that are four feet by 15 feet long. Line the whole perimeter. Take a great big 12 by 15 and open it up in the room. I know, I know, I know. If you use good paint and you take your time when you're painting, you generally don't have a mistake. But that's why they call it mistakes, because they happen when you don't expect it. So make sure you cover everything up, protect your floors, and avoid the need to go around after you've done your job with a little piece of wet sandpaper trying to take the paint off the floor. Tip number eight is all about how to solve your problems once you've got your first coat of paint on. So obviously, we gotta do the first coat. In this particular case, the window was framed with unprimed wood, so I had to prime it. There's one coat of semi-gloss on the rest of this. Make sure every single joint, especially around windows, is cocked. Cocking, 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 cocking everywhere, okay? And then you take your brush and you're gonna cut all the joints because the mini roller isn't gonna get in those joints. All right, and we're gonna just really get that all filled up nice. All right. Then we're going to take our mini roller and we're going to apply our, all our flat surfaces. If you do the brushwork afterwards, like after your mini roller, you're not going to have the same texture. Okay, so brush first and you can roll into the corners and that'll change almost all the texture on that surface. And that is the best way to get that done. There we go. Now, same for up here. Let's finish this all the way to the other end. All right, and then cut that gap. There we are. Okay, you're gonna find that if you're using plywood like I did, you're gonna need a primer, two coats of your semi, possibly even two coats of primer, depending what primer you put on here. But you really wanna make sure that when all is said and done, it's perfect every time. Now here's a word of warning for you. When you're doing this, you can't put a coat on, wait an hour until it feels dry and then put a coat on. Nothing is sealing. Real wood will just keep on soaking up the moisture, soaking up the moisture, and you're gonna be left with a product that doesn't look like it got painted, okay? Oh, oh there's a trick for you. All right, get that right in the groove. Yeah. Here's the thing, if you do a primer and then a finished coat, let it sit 24 hours and then come back. Wait until it's actually set up and really dry and then you put the next coat on, it'll sit on the surface without penetrating into the wood again. That's the secret to getting this done with one primer and two coats of finish. If you try to hurry and you're moving along too fast and trying to do all the coats in one day, you'll come back the next day, you'll be disappointed and you'll have to do another coat. So the process is simple guys, right? Dust it. If you don't have a duster, grab an old brush that's getting clogged up with an acrylic. I like to just buy a cheap square brush and then we're gonna hit our drywall primer, cut it right down onto the baseboard. And I'll tell you, the process here is simple. I'm gonna walk you through this. I paint the baseboard one coat. I use a caulking bead. We do a coat on the wall. We find our mistakes. We fix them. We prime them. And then we're gonna paint them. And when it's all said and done, the process works like this. You paint all your door casing and window casing. Then you do your second coat on your wall. And then you come back and you do 
the last coat on your baseboard. I'm going to show you this and how easy this is. And I know everybody has this issue. Oh, some guys are commenting on channels in the past and they're like, we don't believe in that. We like to put green tape here. I like to paint my baseboards first and then protect it with tape. Listen, when you're cutting and you've got a wall surface to cut, I got four inches that I can fool around with here to get a perfect line. When I'm working with just a baseboard, that's a half an inch thick. One little mistake, it's all up the wall. Do things in order that give you the most mercy. Do all your casings first, and then use your wall to push your brush and to draw your line around your casing. Draw all your wall and do it all your wall up against your baseboard. And at the very, very end, you come back and use the baseboard. You can set your brush and you can use just a little bit of the brush to make the cut line. I'm gonna show you that in just a second. Once all your patches are dry, you give them a quick sand and then you gotta prime them. We're going right back to when we were finished our first coat. I have never been on a job that we sanded, primed, prime checked, did a first coat and we were happy with the first coat. Never been on one. And you might think, oh, that's because you're a lousy drywall taper, Jeff. I'm like, no, it's just because once you add the paint, you change the way the light bounces around the room and you're gonna see things that you didn't see before. And if you don't believe me, that's just the way it is. That's just a law of painting. You're just not going to get a perfect job unless you put the time and energy in to be critical about your work after you get your first coat on. If you're not critical, yeah, it'll look great. Most homeowners I know are trying to do the best job possible, so that requires being critical. The reason we're using the primer is because we don't want to waste our money. If I prime just the spot that I did this with, and then I come back with a mini roller with the wall paint, I'm only using an ounce or so of paint. But if I don't prime and I just use the wall paint to cover it up and go, oh, that's good enough, what's going to happen is you're going to finish your second coat and then you're gonna see all those patches on the wall. And then you're gonna to have to do a whole third coat. That'll cost you another gallon. And in today's market, a good gallon of paint runs you almost 100 bucks. Do the couple ounces, prime it, let it dry. I know it's an extra step, but it works. And it'll save you money in the long run. Now, here's the process. Last day of new construction. We're gonna be sanding these walls. So before we get the sanding of the walls, we wanna get our primed patch wall color. This back to first coat. All right, now I don't have to worry about little wispy tails and stuff like that. I don't even have to worry about great coverage. When you have a good quality paint, you're gonna be just fine with a mini roller. The secret here, just get all this done. Give this about an hour to set up before you paint the walls. And if you get a lint on the wall, hey, here we go. Get rid of that now. Don't leave lint on the wall when you're finishing off the primer like this. Because when you sand that back, it'll leave another white spot. All right, all I gotta do when I go to paint this wall now is I'll start with the cut line down there on the bottom and then start on that wall and come around the room. By the time I get back to here, this wall will be nice and dry. Piece of cake. All right, last step, of course, is your sanding pole. People ask me all the time, what's the grit that I use on the paper? The thickest you wanna use is 220. Go up to 400 if you want. Again, you can feel the roughness after the first coat. And if you get really, really close, you'll see a bunch of little white dots appearing in the paint. That is the roughness smoothed off. That's what you're gonna have, and that's okay. The second coat's gonna cover all of that. So all you need to know now, guys, if you've got two coats, you sand in between coats, you're gonna need a duster, and that's an older brush, okay? Clean any dust off the baseboards from that sanding environment. And the last thing you need to do is cut a line on your trim with the brush. You can see the edge, set the brush up against the right in that gap of the wall. And there we go. That's it. Cheers to next time. All right, guys, back here with the finished coat. This is a, um, it's a Verithane water-based finish enamel. I don't want these doors to be too shiny and it just needs a little bit of a stir here. There we go. Last thing you want to do with these things is really mix a whole lot of air into them. And so treat them like an oil, even though it's a water base. Okay, here we are. Yeah, it's gonna make a hell of a mess, isn't it? Try working out of the top of that can. This is not paint, this is really watery, okay? Here we go. It's like a wet glue. <laughs> Here we go. And because it's water-based, you start at the top and you work your way down. So we're gonna work, let's do the inside of this first. Here we go. Now remember, this is like next day. We've given this thing, what? at least eight hours to dry. And I wanna just get a little bit of that up inside there. There we go. Okay. 
very important that we get a nice consistent coverage on all the surfaces so that they're all going to look the same later. This milkiness, of course, is going to dry out, so don't be worried about it. That's why we're showing it to you, because this looks a lot different than an oil-based finish, doesn't it, going on? Okay. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and paint the whole doors, both sides, and then we're going to pop on the door handles and show you all the finished trim. All right? All right. Time for the handles for the doors, guys. Now, here we go. Interesting. Ah, so for simplicity, ah, I'm putting this tape roughly where I want my handle to go. Okay, on both sides, which is the middle of this exposed panel. That's the bottom. And my handles aren't quite that big, but that's fine. First of all, let's get the let's get the level line on there. It's difficult to see. There it is. Okay, so we've got to drill some holes here. And now I got some tools on me. I feel like I'm not naked for this dance. Here we go. Um, the instructions, cute. Told me to get a drill bit um, 730 seconds. They don't even carry that size. But the hole isn't as important, okay, as the torque you're using. All we got to do is pick a bit that's just a little bit wider than this bolt. So now I know what I'm going to drill with. I need to get a really accurate measurement from screw to screw on this. Set screw is the middle of the handle. So instead of measuring from middle to middle, I'm going to measure from the outside to the top. And that'll be the same number. So 11 and an eighth and a bit. I'll put the handle down for a minute. 11 and an eighth and a bit. Wow. Okay. That's that. 11 and an eighth and a bit. Okay. This one is sticking out three and three quarters. One and a half, one and seven eighths. Yeah, so just below, just before the two inch, one and seven eighths. One and seven eighths. Okay. Here we go. That's why you gotta love having tape. Now we're just going to drill the holes. This is nice. My hole is trying to... My bit was running on me, so I came at it from an angle. And now I straightened it out to finish the hole. Oof. I'm not going to make anything vertical if I have a bit running around on me. Okay, they're good bits, but uh, they don't have a little tip, so they like to run. All right, now we can lose the tape. I got these handles on Amazon. They're nice, and they're, they're big enough that they can cover any kind of marring or chipping that happens on the wood. And it just gets threaded in. Nice. I got to get my little plastic caps on here. Okay. What they do is they just set a depth of a sixteenth of an inch off the wood. Nice clean finish. <coughs> there we go. We just get these started with our fingers. Okay, I see what's happening here. Wow. I want to have that nice and square. Yeah, nice, sweet. Okay, and of course, this finishes off with an Allen key. Open that up, make enough room for it. There's a delicate space here where you can open it up far enough. And if you open it up too much, it just falls to the ground. So try to be in a quiet space while you're doing this. <laughs> okay, at least this one can roll around, 
mouth through the door. Okay. And we'll do the same on the other side. Now the doors are done. <laughs> I popped in that last piece of trim and now I'm putting in screws right at the end of my track so that they can't pop out. I don't need to move them into metal to do any more work. So this is to make sure that they have a stopper right where the, where the screws are. Yeah. All right. There's the doors. Whew. We're here in the finished theater room. Now it's time for our sound test. Now the way we're gonna do this is simple. We've got a little DeWalt stereo here, job site radio. We're gonna play some music, then we're gonna step outside and we're gonna play it again. And we're gonna go upstairs and play it again so that you can hear the difference in how much noise is going through the house from my microphone. All right, here we go. All right, now that's pretty comfortable, but it's loud. Not bad with the doors closed, eh? Now let's go upstairs and see what it's like in the room directly above it. All right, there we go, guys. Now you can still hear it a little bit, right? No soundproofing system is perfect when you're in a house with central heating and air. Because right this room, we have three pieces of ductwork that tie together with that main trunk line from that room downstairs. Unfortunately, this is the expectation. Now, if you're a bunch of people hanging out in the living room watching another movie, this is not gonna bother you. This is just a little bit of background noise. It's not the end of the world. So, no, we're not making it so you can't hear what's going on. We're making it so that it doesn't affect you in another space in the house. And I think this is a really good demonstration. That sounds like a mile away. <laughs>